The internet has no lack of issues right now. It's almost a cold war zone at this point. We have leakers coming out from Facebook daily almost. And we just had a leaker from Facebook come out talking about how <laughs> she doesn't think Facebook was doing enough to censor people and how they need government regulation. And then magically, immediately the next day, the government comes back and says, oh, yes, you know, Facebook is just un unable to self-regulate. They need parental governmental guidance to to uh, make sure that they're more censorious. We know what's coming. We can see it coming. A vast lack of freedom of association in our digital spaces is happening. And what one of the things I love more than anything else is interviewing people that are not just bitching. They're actively creating solutions to this problem. Today, we're going to have the uh, benefit of talking to one of those people. From Dallas, Texas, this is Anarchast. Greetings, ambassadors. Welcome back to Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I will be Patrick Smith. Today, our guest is David. He's been in the Bitcoin space for a decade and has been an anarchist his entire life, although he didn't figure that out until about 15 years ago. He now works with Start9 Labs to help people declare their digital independence. Welcome to the show, David. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm doing really well. How are you today? I'm good. I'm excited to talk to you. This interview has been like months in the making. I think we've been trying to schedule it for like half a year, it seems like. I know we're we're all extremely yeah. busy people. I am super excited about your project. Uh, but before we get into that project and what you guys are working on and why I'm excited about it, uh, I we the first question I have to ask you on this show is, sir, how did you become an anarchist? Sure. That's a great question. And, and that's, a, you know, something that I like to discuss with other people. And you kind of find out that people come from all different directions as far as finding this philosophy. Uh, for me, it started uh, very early on. I was probably about 13. I don't remember exactly, but I was wandering around on the much younger Internet. And um, my curiosity would lead me to just the, the, the corners that no one else really was interested, like these little pockets of of things that I would find on IRC and um, all these other earlier systems. And I read about anarchy and I was like, well, this is really like interesting, but it didn't, it never settled with me. It kind of was like, okay, that makes sense. But like, like we have the government and we got to have that or whatever. Um, and so like that kind of just sat with me and I kind of continued looking at these kind of things, but it, it was really uh, not until maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, probably about seven years later when I was about 20 uh, that the, the that a lot of the illusions started to fall and i started to see like okay well if none of the stuff that's currently working or if none of the stuff that's currently happening around us all these institutions and centralized organizations and whatnot if none of them are functioning particularly well then maybe that thing that i was reading about when i was a kid maybe that might work and i started to look into it more seriously and i've basically been an anarchist ever since so i i kind of I, I came at it from uh like a philosophical standpoint for sure um but, but yeah, that's uh, that's the short short story. <laughs> what what was the sort of philosophical trail that you led? Like, where did you get started in philosophy, and what you know trail did you follow? Yeah, well, so in that later part of my life, in my early twenties, is when I started to figure out how money was created. That was a big a big one, and also uh, nine eleven. I think uh, is another one that comes up a lot for people. The uh, deception around such a huge event, and like how um you know how 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 we could be so misled about something that was such a big deal and such a huge impact on us um i think those were the two triggering things when i figured out you know and, and they, they kind of come together as well with like the insider trading surrounding uh the events of 9 11 and things like that and you start to see this bigger picture of like okay well there's these people who um you know are able to use power and influence and money because they have control over how money is created uh, to um, cause, you know, to, to spread their agendas, um, you know, in an immoral fashion. Uh, and so that kind of led me down the rabbit hole of, okay, well, the whole thing is immoral. Like, how can another man, ha how can a man have authority over another man? You know, it just doesn't work that way. And if that can't happen, then how can a man give uh, authority over himself to another man, you know, in the form of government, representative government, so-called? 
uh, to represent oneself. So yeah, that all just stopped making sense. And I just was lucky that I had already had this glimpse of this other idea and was able to just revisit that and then do a deep dive. Um, and I was fortunate to, you know, I was working, this is actually a, bi a big part of my story too, is that I was working a lot of menial labor, uh, assembly lines, uh, factories, warehouses, and I just had my headphones in 14 hours a day and I was chunking down podcasts and audiobooks and lectures and anything I could get my hands on. And I was just sucking down information because what I never learned in school was that I love to learn. And it was because I was having to learn all this stuff that was forced upon me that I wasn't interested in. But when I got to choose the subjects and it was like, okay, history, anarchy, philosophy, all this stuff, I couldn't get enough. <laughs> you know, and I was Man, fortunate that I, I was identify to... with that. Wow. Yeah. I, I would leave school and then begin learning every night. I would learn coding exactly. and computers late into the night every night. That was my passion. And then I would go to school and just hate everything. <laughs> like, yeah, I would just oh, yeah. totally shut down while at school because of the way they handled us and and tried to force, I guess, their, I don't know, topics and indoctrination on us. I absolutely get that. It's like I unschooled myself at night and, you know, public schooled myself during, well, not myself. I didn't have a choice, but yeah, public school during the day and unschool at night made me who I am. Um, so that, I don't think I've ever, if I have, I've rarely heard someone say that 9-11 was what got them woke up. Like it, by far, it's mostly Ron Paul. And then second to Ron Paul is probably Molyneux in terms of just the number of, of uh, anarchists created people that reference those two people as part of their journey to waking up to anarchism. 9-11, uh, mm -hmm. that's interesting. And so you had this foundation from uh, from your earlier time in life, as well as a bunch of podcasts you were listening. What podcasts? Were, were there any particular ones that um, that were part of your journey? Um. It, it, it's hard to it's hard for me to pick pick out podcasts from the earlier years of uh, of this path of discovery for me. Um, a lot of that was actually audiobooks. So um, mm. you know Emma Goldman, uh, uh, Bakunin, um, you know folks like that. Um, but what kind of brought it all together for me, and it's kind of uh, synchronistic here because I'm wearing a shirt from his website, is Mark Passio's podcast, What on Earth Is Happening. Um, that really took and filled in a lot of the missing pieces for me and gave me that bigger picture that that really like solidified things for me. Like I had, uh, you know, in this corner, I, I understood, you know, gun rights. And in this corner, I understood why government was immoral. And in this corner, I understood why central banking was a problem and uh, money creation, and all that. Uh, but this kind of brought the whole thing together for me when I started to learn and understand about natural law. Interesting. All right. Well, I just did a commentary on his recent documentary on my other channel, Disenthrall. It's uh, it's it, interesting that you bring up Passio. That's cool. Okay. So let's now move from that into how did you, what is Start9 and how did you get involved with them? Sure. So I'll just tell my story how I came uh, to find them. And I think that'll help uh, kind of paint a picture of who they are as well. Um, so for many years, I was kind of learning how to use uh, technological tools of different kinds in, in my spare time, kind of like you said you were. Um, and one of the things that I was interested in doing was uh, building Bitcoin nodes. And then when Lightning Network came uh, online, I started to build Lightning Network nodes as well. And what I was discovering was that this process was a pain in the ass. You know, it would take several days to build, even if you were competent with Linux and the command line and whatnot. And I was just like, I was, I was building this stuff and I was like, okay, I got mine to work. And it was just like kind of bittersweet. Cause I was like, this sucks. No one is ever going to use this. It's a pain in the ass to use. Uh, and this is something that I think I was complaining to a friend of mine about. And he was like, well, have you heard of star nine? And I was like, no. And he's like, well, check them out. And they basically were making these uh, little boxes, these little raspberry pies that had an operating system on it that allows you to install uh, several different kinds of software, but among those softwares were uh, Bitcoin and Lightning Network nodes with a single click. And so I ordered one up, I checked it out, and within, I don't know, uh, 15 minutes of opening the box, it's like I'm already doing the initial Bitcoin sync and I can install Lightning while I'm waiting for that. And I was like, okay, people might actually use the Lightning Network if it's this easy. Uh, so they got me really excited. I called them up. I was like, hey, do you guys need any help? And they were like, no. I was like, okay, <laughs> uh, went back to what I was doing. And, uh, about a month later, I happened to be on their website for 
some other reason, reason. And I saw that they had jobs postings up and I hit them up again. I was like, Hey, uh, it's me again. You guys need help now. And they were like, okay, well let's sit down and chat. And, uh, it turns out that they had uh, done some fundraising and they were ready to, uh, bring on some new, uh, some new employees. And that's how I got started with them. Interesting. Okay. All right. Well, so we let, let's talk about it now. I'm going to make no assumptions and I'm going to pretend that I know nothing about raspberry Pis or anything like that. And I don't actually know a great deal about embassy uh, box in general. So it's going to be easy for me to play ignorant in that regard. Um, what is a raspberry Pi? And talk to me like, you know, I am a boomer. <laughs> okay. So Raspberry Pi is just a very small computer. Uh, it's used uh, mostly for educational and hobbyist purposes. So, uh, for example, teaching a child how, uh, how to use various things with a computer um, or how to use a Linux operating system, for example. Uh, and hobbyists use it for all kinds of things. You can use it to monitor your garden. You can use it to set up all kinds of different software. Do you at have your one home. you can hold uh, up? Uh, no, funnily enough, normally the answer to that is yes. <laughs> I'm sure I have one upstairs. Um, I know I, I have one. In. I have one somewhere within 10 feet of me. It would just take me a while yeah, to get it, so it's not important. Anyway, it, it just looks like yeah, a little it's box. I don't yeah. have one right now. It, it's the size of a deck of cards, and yeah. uh, the, the the cases that we sell, it's a little black uh, black case, and there's no fan. That's it, actually uh, the the case is a heat sink, so the case heats up, and that's what's dissipating the heat from the from the chip and yeah. that, for that reason it's silent which is kind of a nice feature cool i'm pulling up a i'm pulling up a little image just to show people what we're talking about because I, I the main takeaway that i'm trying to get people to realize today on the show is how they're making this non-scary they're making this non-intimidating for people that uh, are not technology geniuses so um, maybe if you could, can you share your screen and maybe show us the embassy website or the store? And that has a picture of the, of the actual oh, device yeah, sure, on it specifically. Uh, but yeah, yeah so th think of it like a pre, correct me if I'm wrong. This is like a pre-configured computer. You get it, you buy it, it arrives in the mail, you plug it in, uh, you plug in like a monitor to it, right? And, uh, and a keyboard, or do you just connect to it okay. over the network or like, what, what is it? Like how? How would a newbie use this device? And then, you know, while you're sharing your screen, uh, you're welcome to like actually flip over and show us your device even. And uh, and we can just like dive into it. Yeah. Cause I'm super excited about this for many reasons I want to get into. Sure, so are you seeing uh, yep. the Start9 website here? Cool, so uh, this little box, I don't know if you can see my mouse cursor or not, but this yep, little box in the forefront here, that is the, uh, that is the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and like I said, it's about the size of a deck of cards. And all those uh, ports that you see there um, are uh, mostly unused. Basically, when you get this device, you're going to plug in the power cable and you're going to plug in an Ethernet cord into the uh, Ethernet port right there on the right side. Uh, and you're going to plug that into your router. Uh, and kind of like your router, you're going to kind of just forget about it because you don't need to plug in a monitor or a keyboard or anything like that. This is all going to be accessed through the web browser, which you can kind of see on the uh, devices in the background there. You can either access it from your phone or from your um, uh, from your laptop or your PC. Uh, and I can go ahead and jump into the interface now if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Let me do a little bit of setup right before we do that though. So like sure. six, six or seven years ago, um, I was already frustrated with the level of censorship on social media and I was envisioning a way to create a decentralized social media network. But I was I was seeing the problems in advance. I was saying, well, if it's decentralized, then the, the data has to be stored on premise with all of the users um, for, for it to be resilient and non censorable. And what that means is that I would either need to build out a suite of software to run on people's computers and people would have to leave their computers plugged in, turned on and connected to the Internet all the time for it to work. And, the, you know, the moment it didn't work, the all their data would fall offline or I would have to develop some kind of little um, device or appliance that people could that that laymen could just plug into their networks and hit the power switch and boom that would host all of their social data their images their connections you know their encrypted messages all this stuff and so mm -hmm. I started going down the path of developing this um, decentralized uh, social appliance social network appliance and then um, I got busy with another company that I started and the the project never went anywhere and then now as you know I'm working at Float. Uh, which is a social network with plans to, you know, hopefully one day 
create or turn or evolve itself into a decentralized social network. And it sounds like embassy might be the thing that we need to look at for doing this because it'll allow a layman to plug it in, like you said, access it mm -hmm. with a web browser and maybe just open up an app that handles all the messy details for them. So with I, I just wanted to kind of lay that groundwork because this is why I'm so excited about what you're doing. This is what maybe the world needs a lot right now is like an appliance that laymen can use to just very quickly and easily decentralize themselves, take ownership of their digital life and data back from these centralized companies. Okay. Enough rambling. I'll, back to you. Back to you. Show us, uh, show us what you got here. Sure. So why don't we just hop over to the interface real quick? Um, there's, there's something that I'm not going to dive into because this is actually a personal device of mine that I use and you, do, you don't want to expose um, certain things like your tour addresses and things like that. Yeah. Um, but what I'll do is I'm going to walk you through the interface. And then I think what we'll do, since I'm not using uh, this app here, we'll uninstall it and I'll show you that flow real quick. Um, so quick prayer to the demo gods, because we weren't planning on a demo, but uh, let's let's see how it goes here. So surprise, this page surprise. right here, yeah, <laughs> this, this page right here is uh, my services page. And as you can see at the top, this is showing my installed services. So this is everything uh, that I have on my embassy right now. Uh, and again, this what we're looking at, this is through uh, the Firefox web browser. You can access through several different browsers. Uh, and some of these applications, uh, like, for example, Sphinx Chat or Bitwarden, uh, they have their own native applications as well. So you can access uh, directly through those and just connect your server. Because uh, what this is is a personal server, right? This is uh, a place where you can have. Um, so one thing I like to say is anytime you hear the term cloud, that just means somebody else's computer. Okay. Yes. So in this yeah. case, in this case, the cloud belongs to you. This is your computer. So um, all these services with the little green dot here, that means that they are currently up and running. And you can see there that they say running. Um, and they are all running simultaneously and they run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and you don't really have to think much about systems administration, which is typically a very difficult thing to do. So running your own software is something that's been possible for a long time, but it requires a lot of uh, technical skill that most people just don't have the time to learn. So we want to make it easy for you to run your own software. Okay, so uh, so this is the services page and I can access these services from here. Um, let's move on real quick to let, the let, let me just let me just point out. Let me ask your question. Actually, back on the services page, the matrix sure. icon, the matrix synapse icon. Is that a matrix yeah. client or a matrix server? So this is the server. So Synapse is uh, so Matrix. There's a there's a lot of uh, kind of terminology surrounding Matrix, and the reason for that is Matrix is an, an open protocol. You can kind of yep. think about that as as Bitcoin, for example. Let, um, let, so let me let me take it from let me take it from here because I run a Matrix server for our listeners. We have both a Discord server and a Matrix server that I administrate, and that the donors thankfully you know pay for the administration and hosting for. The matrix in and this is I'm just kind of illustrating this to back up his point about the goal of their project. The matrix synapse server was what is one of the most difficult to uh, initialize and set up and host and administrate servers that there are. And for them to have just made it plug and play for you in this regard is amazing, like truly amazing out of all the servers I host for people. The Matrix Synapse server is my least favorite one to mess with. So it's awesome that it looks like you've turned it into a button. I find that amazing. Um, well done. Yeah, well, I, I, I will put a caveat on there. It is the, like, as you said, um, it, it, it that kind of carries over a little bit because this is the most difficult um, application to use on our platform as well. And the reason for that uh, doesn't really surround so much uh, this interface, um, but the fact that everything here is running its own Tor hidden service. So the complications with Matrix come around setting up your client and configuring it to run uh, only over Tor uh, to connect to this. Um, but we do have uh, a simple set of instructions to do that. And, and I'll actually uh, be able to show you that here shortly. Now the reason okay. that now the reason that this one's is, is this one's yellow, okay? So that means it, you know, it's trying to get your attention. This one's not running uh, and, and this is telling you why. Uh, and, you know, there's not just, uh, you know, a thousand pages of logs that you got to read through and try and figure it out. It's telling you right here, there's a problem. And the problem is that this needs configuration. And so what that means in this case is that I installed this matrix server, uh, but I did not configure it. 
And uh, so that's something that'll walk me through, but we'll, we'll return to that. I did want to briefly say that the, around the terminology here. So matrix is a protocol and a protocol is basically just like a language uh, that um, program that software can use to understand each other. So they, they're speaking a common language if they understand the matrix protocol. Synapse is an implementation uh, of a matrix server. So that means that Synapse is the name of the software that's actually running in this case. Um, matrix is kind of uh, not the appropriate logo to put here, but Synapse doesn't have a logo. So, <laughs> so that's what we used. Um, but let's let's return to that. Let's go now, um, unless are you have any other questions on the status page. A nerdy question. Are these Docker containers that it's running? Like, what, what is it using? That's correct, yeah. So okay. these are all running in Docker containers, and the way that our um, architecture is working in the... Uh, this is the, the present version, I should mention. This is our um, O2, uh, version O2, O.2 uh, line of Embassy OS, and we are uh, putting the finishing touches on. I was hoping that it would be done for this interview, but it's not quite ready to show off yet. Our version O3 is slightly different, and that architecture is going to allow uh, potentially in the future for different uh, containerization methods. So we, we, we're not necessarily tied to Docker, but currently it has great support and it's working well for us uh, at the moment. So yes, each of these is its own individual Docker container, uh, which uh, serves itself as a Tor hidden service. So they're all their own separate Tor hidden services. Correct. Yeah. Okay, uh, awesome. As well as the embassy itself. So this is also being served as its own Tor hidden. The, the whole interface is being served as a uh, Tor hidden service as well. In this case, this device um, is uh, here on the network that I'm on, so I'm accessing it locally, which is uh, makes it a little bit snappier. Okay. All right, cool. What's next? Cool. So you see here we just got four tabs on the left. Uh, we try to keep it as simple as we can because um, a lot of this software is complex enough on its own just to understand why and how to use. So we try to keep it as simple as we can. So here on the Embassy tab, uh, we have some things that you might expect to see um, for example, you can check out what version you're on here. I'm on 0216, which is our current, uh, uh, current latest. You can see how big a uh, disk you've got. Um, this is the LAN address I was talking about, uh, and, uh, so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, moving on. Oh, actually I skipped over a lot of stuff here. So, and then we've got a monitor so you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, actually, let's check this out. Okay, so this is um, what's actually physically happening on the Raspberry Pi. As I said, it's just a computer. Um, and I want, the reason I wanted to pull this up is to show that I was running, I think, 15 services somewhere in that neighborhood, and I'm using about half of the memory. Uh, now, this is a 4 gigabyte model Pi. Uh, all the current ones we're selling are 8 gigabyte. So you could run uh, quite a few services without uh, overloading the Pi. It's actually um, pretty powerful when you minimize all the um all the software that that you're running and so for example our uh, operating system here is uh written almost entirely in rust uh, there's a little bit of haskell and then the front end is angular uh for the 030 version we've removed all the haskell uh, and now it's entirely rust on the back end and then angular on the front end okay um yeah, so we got in the embassy tab here uh, let did, me know if i'm drawing one too long well, no, no, you're fine, and, and I'm I'm trying to strike a balance between asking nerdy questions and and not scaring off normies. So, like, um, did you did you fork the the Raspberry Pi uh, OS for this, or what did you end up doing for the base OS? Yeah, so this one is based on Raspbian, uh, and we are moving uh, because we wanted 64-bit and a, a couple other things. The 030 version is actually based on Ubuntu Server, uh, and so that's going to be the base moving forward. Cool. Okay. All right, what's next? Cool. So uh, we've got logs here, which you could use if uh, there was any issues. We could have you pull up your logs and show us uh, what's going on in there so that we could help you diagnose any kind of issue. Uh, config is basically to change the name. There's not a lot of stuff going on in there. Um, connect over LAN is the setup for what I'm doing here, which is connecting uh, directly instead of over Tor. Uh, Wi-Fi setup kind of speaks for itself. That's if you want to use Wi-Fi instead of the... Uh, the Ethernet plugin uh, default. Uh, developer options basically allows you to add SSH keys if you want to get into your box. Um, typically an advanced feature, but uh, there might be reasons that you might want to do that. Okay. Uh, and then to restart and shut down the unit. All right. I'm excited about this marketplace link. 
Alrighty. So the marketplace, this is the fun part. So this is like you would expect from uh, your phone's app store, a uh, similar kind of experience where you basically have uh, these different apps to choose from. I, th it, this is a good time to mention actually that when you get this device, uh, it comes with nothing on it except for the operating system. So uh, that services page that I was on, that would be blank. Mm. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, we believe that unlike, you know, Apple or Microsoft or Google or uh, or whatever, uh, that you should decide what's running on your device. Okay, not us. So right. when you when you get a new cell phone, it's almost like you got to spend, uh, you know, uh, two hours removing garbage from it that you yeah. didn't that you did not want. And it's it's you know. It, and they don't even let you remove a lot of the stuff you want unless you're a freaking hacker and know how to you know get access to the absolutely. console. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was walking someone through through a new phone install yesterday. And I was just like, this is, you know, so I was like removing stuff. And then I was like finding out that there was other stuff to remove that was hidden from the user. And it was like, it, it was just unbelievable. And, you know, not when you get a device, you shouldn't have to, you know, um, install a new operating system on it because the old one is so garbage, but yeah. that's, you know, seems like where we're headed. And, and, every and worse than that, somebody went to Maryland and apparently just entering Maryland triggered a thing that uh, it was a, I think it was an Apple phone. Maybe it triggered a thing where I guess the local uh, government warlords or whatever have declared that this app was surreptitiously with no notifications whatsoever installed on their phone to do contract con contact tracing for COVID. And uh, mm. they are a savvy enough person to have realized that that was the case. And it's just mind blowing and insane. Like you don't have control over these phones unless you, uh, if you're using their operating systems. Yeah. And it's really insidious. And uh, you know, every company kind of has their, their, their hands in the pie as it were. So if you get a, let's say you get a, a Motorola phone from T-Mobile with Android on it. Okay. Well, that means that Google's got all their crap on it you know, um, Motorola's got all their crap on it and T-Mobile's got all of their crap on it. You know, it can't just come with a dialer and a text message application and a web browser to get you going. It has to come with all their garbage. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, I digress. Okay. So this comes with nothing <laughs> so, on it. Okay. So this, uh, yeah, completely unlike that, this comes with nothing on it. Um, and, uh, as you see here, um, pretty much everything that's available, I have installed at this time. Um, and, let me just quickly jump down to notifications. This is just telling you what's going on recently on your device. Uh, and, you know, that's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Um, but what I wanted to do was run through a, um, I was going to go ahead and uninstall uh, Synapse and I'll show you what the process looks like. So, um, so let's, we're, we're going to choose an application that we want here. So in this case, Synapse and the, uh, so it's saying, okay, this is already installed. Okay, so you can't install it. So I need to go to the service. And so in, in this way, the UI tries to lead you to what you want instead of you having to kind of guess uh, and figure it out. Okay, so in this case, I, I want to show and install. So we're going to just hit uninstall here. Will result in the deletion of data. I didn't put anything on there because it wasn't configured. That needs config. That comes up at the beginning, um, as you'll see here shortly. Uh, of every um, service install, okay? All right, so that's now uninstalled. Let's go back to the marketplace here. And the reason that the marketplace has uh, a loading time as opposed to everything else is that this is the only time that you're reaching out to uh, a third-party service. Um, and it's important to note here, so in this case, we're looking at the Start9 marketplace, okay? Now, we don't want to be a central point of failure like Google and Apple are, and we don't want control over your software. So as um, a result of that, we've built in the ability to change marketplaces. OK, so you can point uh, your device at another marketplace if, for example, we don't offer an application that you want for some reason or you don't trust us or what have you. We do try to um, keep sensible defaults. We're going to keep malware out of our marketplace, things like that. So there will be some discretion. This isn't just going to be a free for all in here because these are things that we vouch for uh, and uh, as well as offer uh, technical support with. Um, you know, it, it's the people that worry about 
you know, how people that might not trust them can still interact with their platforms. Those tend to be the ones that you want to trust, like the people that actually think <laughs> like that. Like we were just a, a, a kind of a semi-private internal discussion at Float that we were having. We were talking about some stuff that we're working on integrating with the new uh, Float token. Uh, and we're, we're working on how we're integrating the Float token transactions with our platform. And one of the discussion points that came up was like, hey, we don't need mm -hmm. to store this. Th I won't get into the specifics, but a lot of this information like, why do we need to know that? Let's just like not store that. Let's just leave that, you know, to the user. And, you know, we don't need to have purview over that. Any other company would be like, give me, give me, give me. I want all the data that I could possibly have so that I can, I don't know, spam or spy or, you know, run AI algorithms on. And we're like, no, 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 we don't. We don't even want to see that. Like, don't show it to us. We're not storing it. You know, keep that away from us. That's 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 what we need in our companies. Yeah, and um, you know, realistically, Start Nine, or at least as it exists today, uh, should in you know, like in theory, we could make ourselves irrelevant in the future. And what I mean by that is that we could make it to where the community basically owns this project, and then we would just splinter off and make uh, companies uh, that are ancillary uh, and support all the new things that the community comes up with that we couldn't possibly have done on our own, right? Because that's the beauty of open source. Um, I, I should mention that this is an open source operating system as well. Uh, and we can maybe come back to that later. Yeah, sure. Um, so, okay. So now we've got uh, a marketplace listing here for an application that we want. Uh, we see here uh, what's in the latest version, what happened. So some change notes uh, or some, some change log here, if you want to see what, what's uh, the latest in an update. Uh, and uh, their GitHub page if you want to go and see um, more details on that, a short description. And if we wanted to install a version other than the most recent, that's an option as well. So let's go ahead and install this. And uh, this is a pretty hefty package, if I recall correctly. So we might uh, yeah. we might chat about something else while this is installing. Yeah, why don't we go back um, to your face? Why don't we go back to your face until it's done and we can talk about uh, sure, maybe yeah. the, the company and the structure of the company. Um, you know, what is it like? What's, what's the leadership like uh, at Start9? Um, are they sort of libertarian anarchist leaning? Yeah, so um, certainly uh, the, the there's not like a we, we, we have talked about we probably should have like guiding principles and a mission statement uh, public on our website. Uh, that's just something that we just haven't made a priority. Um, but I think that, you know, that'll probably come soon. We're actually getting ready to launch a new website as well. So um, in fact, now that I think about it, I think there's a mission statement on there. So uh, you, you can get a, a better idea of our philosophy that way. Uh, also, the origin of our name uh, would tell you a lot about, um, about our philosophy as well. Uh, certainly, you know, I, I've spoken for myself. I identify completely openly as an anarchist. I think everyone's an anarchist deep enough down, uh, and it's a matter of, of figuring it out. Um, but I think, you know, without speaking particularly to everyone there, that most people there have an anarchist or a libertarian lean, um, without doubt. And one thing that I really love about the company is even when I was the, uh, the freshest and the newest employee, my voice was still equally important. Now, I might not have the final say on a decision, especially because, um, you know, there's uh, three founders there who have uh, invested, you know, years of their life at this point. Um, now, they're the primary decision makers, but my voice would at least be heard. I would be listened to uh, and taken into consideration anything that I had to say. Uh, and that continues to this day. And it's, um, you know, uh, it, it's also worth mentioning that I was working for myself for uh, five years before finding this company, and I didn't need uh, a job whatsoever. This is something that I reached out to them to do. And when I heard um, some of the things they were saying on podcasts, and when I was able to finally chat with them face to face, I realized, uh, you know, we're on the same page here. We're not just reading the same book, we're on the same page. So uh, certainly, I, uh, you know, these are my best friends now, in addition to my coworkers. Well, the, the website does say, and it's underlined, welcome to the era of sovereign computing. So you're a harmful extremist is what, what this is saying, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, we don't get put on lists, right? We just get moved up and down these days. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. So sovereign computing, is that kind of the mission statement for the company is giving yeah, us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we got a couple. Uh, one is to 
help you be sovereign over your data, and another is to help you declare digital uh, independence, which means uh, mostly from uh, the big tech giants. But you know, alongside of that is obviously the alphabet boys and uh, various governments that uh, want to interfere uh, and be a middleman and 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 take all the data that you're trying to interact with someone else with and be a middleman to that and be like, okay, well, some of this data, maybe it's not allowed or some of this data is dangerous. Some of this you shouldn't see, uh, so on and so forth. Oh, and here's a bunch of advertisements as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, so one of the things that, that you struggle with, though, when you're trying to run a company that isn't using the traditional models for revenue, like advertising and you know selling your users' data to people, is how do you monetize it? How are you guys planning on you know, being profitable as a company? Where are you getting your income from, especially if it's open source? That's usually a big challenge. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so this is a good time to mention uh, how... Uh, how we sell this product. Okay. So it is free and open source. So we, we kind of have three options that are on a sliding scale, right? And the scale is uh, cheapest and most difficult to uh, most expensive and uh, easiest to use. Okay. So um, if you go to our GitHub repository, you can download our source code, build it, compile it from source, uh, and you own it. You don't have to ask us for permission. You don't have to give us a penny, nothing. We do accept donations if you like, um, but uh, there's no obligation whatsoever. And that belongs to you and you can do with it what you'd like uh, for personal use. Uh, the next option is that you want to use your own uh, Raspberry Pi. Maybe you have one laying around already. Maybe you don't trust our supply lines. Maybe you don't want to give us your shipping address. There's any number of reasons for this. Uh, and in that case, you can purchase just the operating system image. And so that would be offered as a download. Uh, you can pay in Bitcoin or Lightning Network if you'd like. Uh, and then you download that and you have to give us essentially zero information whatsoever. Um, we also have a uh, um, Tor website, so you don't even have to give us your IP address. Uh, and then the third and final option is for the people that want the plug and play. Okay, And that means that... Uh, you give us a shipping address as traditionally um, when buying a, a, a you know a, a um, tangible product, uh, and we ship you the device in the mail, uh, ready to plug into the wall and go with no additional effort. And that's um, the most expensive option. So what was the what was the, just for the image? Uh, so the image is that you just want to purchase the software. Okay. Yeah, I mean, how, mu how so, much was it? Um. Oh, sh I, I want to say I, we could hop over the website, but I want to say it's around one hundred and eighty dollars today. OK. Uh, and there are some people, um, actually, several people have reached out and said, hey, I bought the operating system. I could have easily compiled it from source, but I considered that a donation. So some people use that as a donation method as well. That's what um, I was just about to say. So so that's your revenue. Then you have the Raspberry Pi device. You have the uh, ISO that you're selling. And it looks like you have an upgrade kit as well for like one hundred and forty bucks. Uh, so that's, that's yeah, your so revenue? That, okay. Uh, yeah, so that's one uh, form of revenue that we have. We actually have um, uh, several possibilities and uh, things that we're thinking about going forward. Um, so one other thing that we do um, is that if you purchase, whether so if you compile from source, part of that process is that you create yourself a product key, which is basically like a, a serial number you could think of. Uh, and if you don't compile from source, if you were to purchase from us, uh, the product key is a thing that you're purchasing along with that. And what we would like to do in the future is offer, you know, special perks and bonuses to people that have um, actually purchased from us a product key. Um, and because that uh, we have a list of all those product keys uh, with uh, no identifying information whatsoever attached. It's just a number. And if you say, hey, I have this number, we can look it up and say, OK, yes, that's a number that we uh, sold to a customer. Um, so that's another uh, incentive, if you will, to purchase from us. Um, additionally, we intend to be a big uh, player in the Lightning Network, so we intend to provide Lightning Network services uh, going forward. Currently, we act as a routing node, um, which is kind of um, one of the only things that's currently available. But in the future, we intend to offer uh, channel leasing, liquidity, things of that nature. Um, so there are a lot of avenues there for um, in income streams as well and we have some other ideas as well cool all right uh, is that uh, are we done installing synapse or where are we on that yeah let's take a peek here all right uh 
I'm surprised that you picked what probably is the most complicated thing to install to, to show <laughs> yeah, in this demo. Be, <laughs> it happened to be the only thing that I wasn't using. It looks like it's still installing. Oh, that's um, right. It happened to be happened to be the only thing that I wasn't already using. And when you do uninstall a service, you are completely wiping that thing out, which is, um, you know, you're destroying that container entirely, which is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a feature, not a bug, because if you ever want to, uh, if, if any kind of service got compromised, because it's in a container, you can just destroy that container, reinstall it, it gets new addresses and everything. Uh, and you can put your data right back into it, and no one knows any information about that, even if it was previously compromised. Is the storage of the device encrypted? Uh, currently, no. That will be it. Will be encrypted in the next version and in the O3 version, and in O31 um, because in O3 it will be encrypted, but it will be. Uh, you won't be able to change the password, so it won't be particularly secure. In 031, we'll add that feature to where the user can actually uh, add their own password, so it will have uh, full at-rest um, data encryption. Okay. All right. Well, man, I think, I mean, I don't think we actually need to see, unless you want us to, I don't think we need to wait around to see the the finish of the Synapse installation. Um, I think I think we get the idea. So um, can anybody develop... And I, got, I don't know, what do they have to do? Submit their Docker container information to you and then you guys will list it in your marketplace or how does that work? And and is it um, is it difficult or easy to kind of uh, wire a Docker container up to, to function on one of these things? Yeah, so um, this is another exciting point is that anyone can, uh, so what we call it is service packaging. Um, you can write your own app for application for this, but typically, uh, as you saw, uh, most of those applications exist already, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what we're doing, uh, and uh, up until this point, um, sorry, my phone's ringing here. Um, up until this point, the uh, services have almost entirely been packaged by us, uh, but going forward, uh, we expect that the community is going to take the helm on uh, packaging up the services that they wanna see. Um, you know, in the same way that Apple and Google don't produce the applications on their uh, platforms, they just produce the platform, right? So we want to do the same thing. We want to make the platform uh, as good as it can be, uh, and then um, developers can package up the applications. So as far as that process, uh, if you go to docs.start9.com, you can find our service packaging guide. Uh, that's a very good um, kind of overview. Uh, that process is the process is changing. Um, quite a bit for the O3 version. Uh, there's a lot of improvements, namely that because we're moving to 64-bit, you no longer have to uh, build everything on your Raspberry Pi, which is kind of a, a pain if you've ever had to do that. You can now build everything as a developer on your uh, development machine, and then just uh, when it's packaged up, test it on your, on your Raspberry Pi. Um, but yeah, there's a service packaging guide which will explain kind of all the uh, different um, uh, pieces of that uh, process uh, and then if you once you get something packaged up and of course reach out to us we're happy to help you uh, with any questions that you have uh, once you get it packaged up you basically submit it to us we take a look make sure it's not malware make sure it's um, you know something that uh, we're okay giving support to and if we're not that uh, we make it um, we make it clear that the support is going to fall to the developer or to the community surrounding that application or what have you. Uh, and then we would either publish it or not. And if we choose not to publish it, which has not happened yet, uh, then you could say, okay, well, I'm going to launch my own marketplace or I'm going to put it on this marketplace over here. And then people could swap marketplaces over um, if we were to reject a, an application for some reason. What kinds of things would you reject? Um, right off the top of my head, malware is the biggest thing. So if there was something that, uh, you know, someone was like, oh, I made this application uh, and it's a game and you, you know, it's like it's you pop candies or something, um, but actually it's running a Monero miner in the background, then we're going to say that's not going on our marketplace, <laughs> you know. Now, if you put that on another marketplace, uh, this device belongs to the person who purchases or builds it. So if they want to install malware on, on their machine, that is their, that's their free will choice. Uh, you know, we're not going to interfere with that, um, but we're not going to host it and put our name on it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it would, you know, harm the experience of your users and they would probably blame you instead of, you know, the bubble popping mm -hmm. game that they installed or whatever. Yeah. That's, that makes sense. Yeah. And also because we're, um, you know, we are a, for lack of a better term, we are a centralized institution, right? Like we're out there in public. We have, uh, you know, our name on things. 
um, if there was something that uh, was, I, I can't even imagine what this would be, but if there was something that was considered, um, you know, that would shoot us to the top of the FBI's list for some reason, uh, then we would ask, you know, quietly that you put that in a, a different marketplace that has nothing to do with us uh, and people could find it on their own. Yeah, I understand that. It makes sense. Uh, are there, what about the mobile support? It's, it's just a browser interface. You can hit it from your mobile browser. Um, so I guess there's no issues there, right? You don't need a computer necessarily. Yeah. And as I said, some of the applications such as Bitwarden, um, have native applications, so you can just use those directly. And when you're using, for example, a lightning network, there are, uh, several different apps that you can choose from that you can connect back, uh, to your embassy node. Uh, and and use that way because when you're when you use Bitcoin or the Lightning Network, you are using a Bitcoin or Lightning node. Um, end of question. End, end of story. It's just a matter of whether or not you're using uh, one provided by the wallet company or if you're running your own. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, that's all the questions I have. Is there anything else that you'd like to let us know or tell us about Start Nine or Embassy that you haven't yet? And uh, and then let us uh, let everybody know where they can find you. Yeah, um, easiest way to find us is start9.com, uh, as well as uh, Telegram and Matrix are our biggest community channels. Uh, we do have a Twitter account as well. Um, we're not on Facebook or any of that. Um, probably should be coming to float, I, I would imagine. Um, and uh, the only thing worth mentioning is that uh, as we're approaching this new release, uh, any orders that are placed now are uh, pre-orders, okay, for for the newer version. Um, and anyone that has uh, the existing version or is uh, ordered it and is waiting for it in the mail or whatever, uh, that upgrade is uh, free of charge. All software updates are always free. We don't charge for those. All right. Sounds good. Start nine. Where can people reach you? Do you want people to reach you? Or do you want them to, or do you want to be anonymous <laughs> and shadowy? Yeah, no. Uh, no, I put my face uh, out there for sure. Um uh, the easiest way way to find me is probably in the Start Nine community channel. Uh, you can find me on uh, Telegram uh, at Circle underscore A, as in a Circle A anarchist Circle A. Um, but uh, yeah, you can find me always chatting in the Start Nine community channel. Um, I have a Twitter at Start Nine Dave that I use just for the company stuff, uh, so I can be found on there. Um, but yeah, if you find me on Telegram, you can find me on other channels as well. All right, man, it was it was fascinating to talk to you. I'm super excited about this project for all sorts of reasons. Uh, not the least of which is the Lightning Network. I've seen a lot of issues. I don't want to digress again into Lightning Network, but I've seen just a million issues to that are standing in the way of Lightning really proliferating and being successful. And having these nodes out there is definitely going to answer some of them. So that's cool. Yeah, I, I think you're you're bringing more to Lightning Network then I don't know. Do they appreciate what you're doing for Lightning Network with these things? I don't know. It's a, it's a pretty big deal. Well, who is they? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. I, yeah, um, I guess Maxis. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, Lightning is uh, Lightning is definitely real. Uh, it works. Um, I, but when we, we see stories like uh, Lightning Tips being rolled out on Twitter, for example, like those are um, those are KYC on ramps, you know, uh, and we don't need that. We don't, you know, yeah, it's convenient. We can use it, but we don't need that. We can run our own nodes. Uh, we can connect to our own nodes with uh, simple um, mobile applications, uh, and we can spend out there just the same way that we would with Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency uh, without having to, you know, carry a, a laptop along with us or anything like that. So, um, yeah, Lightning is exciting. The, the things that can be done um, with Lightning and uh, on top of Lightning going forward uh, really are exciting. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I don't know what else to say about that. I mean, it's, it's still uh, an early technology, um, but it, it's exciting to watch. Awesome. All right, man. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everybody out there for watching the show today. If you like it, you know, hit the like button, uh, leave us a comment to let us know, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Great talk. Yeah, it's been an honor. I really appreciate it. All right. Until next time, guys. I forgot to say the thing. I can't believe it. Peace. Love and anarchy. I can't believe I forgot to say the thing. I never forget to say the thing. <laughs>